Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Levitt, Senior Vice President at the Kaiser Family Foundation, and welcome to KFF's uh, national headquarters. Uh, our hope is to make this a space where we can uh, bring people together to talk about difficult health and, and broader issues. Uh, and like our office in Washington, D.C., we make this space available to nonprofit and public sector groups, as well as doing our own events. Um, to, today, we're thrilled to welcome uh, Dr. Grant Colfax, the new head of the San Francisco Department of Public Health, who brings a unique national and local perspective uh, to many tough, uh, tough health issues, HIV AIDS, homelessness, access to, to mental health care, uh, and most recently, vaping. Um, so uh, again, welcome uh, to our headquarters here. Uh, we, in addition to talking about uh, tough, tough health issues, we do have a nice view of the Bay. If you wander to that side of the office, uh, and we often have dogs too. So, uh, you know, don't bother following any of us on Twitter, but definitely follow KFF Dogs. Um, so I uh, want to uh, introduce Jen Cates, who directs our global health and HIV policy work and is a national expert on these issues in her own right. Uh, and Jen's going to lead the discussion uh, with Grant. So uh, without further ado, please uh, turn off your cell phones and uh, join me in welcoming uh, both uh, Jen and Dr. Colfax. Everyone. Um, we also have KFF cats. So for <laughs> anyone who is a cat fan, we have that too. Um, That's good. Thanks for joining us here. I'm actually based in our DC office and uh, wanted, we, as we're building out this office and, and trying to find uh, ways to help expand the policy conversation in the Bay Area, we wanted to take this opportunity to have these kind of events. So we're excited that you're here. Think of us as you're thinking about your own events going forward. Um, we really want to make this a space where health policy conversations can happen. I'm especially excited to be able to introduce our guest, Dr. Grant Colfax, because I've known him for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, as everyone here knows, he's the current director of health for the city and county of San Francisco. But he has a long history here in San Francisco, starting in 1997 at the Department of Public Health and Prevention, which is what we met not too long after that. He was the director of HIV prevention research. Um, and then uh, eventually became, came to Washington and was the White House Office of National AIDS Policy Director. So going from you know, San Francisco area, national, and overseeing a lot of um, incredible activities around the national HIV AIDS strategy, rolling out uh, new approaches to HIV that he learned from doing them here, and uh, a little bit of bringing back both. So we'll, we'll get to those. Um, and then you came back and you were at Marin County and here you are, full circle, back in San Francisco. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, uh, I, this is going to be a conversation. I'm going to ask Grant some things. We're going to go back and forth. And then eventually, we'll go to you all. So think of your questions. I was told, since it is the Bay Area and it is San Francisco, there's no shortage of questions um, and issues and, and, and things that people want to know. So Only easy ones. Only easy, Only easy ones, ones, please. Oh, um, all right, so my first question to you is you've right. been in this position for, I think, just under four months. That's right. So what's your, wh what, what's your impression now? Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts, having done this or taking stock of where things are? Yeah. What? So I mean, I think it's, it's first of all, uh, thanks for uh, being here for the conversation. And it's just really exciting and inspiring to be back in San Francisco and to uh, help lead a, the, a department that has been so transformative and groundbreaking, I think, for, for several decades now. Mm -hmm. And uh, thinking about where we've been with HIV from ground zero to now mm -hmm. talking about getting to zero. And I want to acknowledge um, former director Merv Silverman is in the audience. And uh, he certainly was at, at uh, ground zero. So. And then thinking about San Francisco's leadership um, under Dr. Sandra Hernandez and Dr. Mitch Katz with regard to uh, really thinking about uh, uh, healthy San Francisco and how that was really one of the first, if not the first, uh, initiative to ensure that all, everybody in a certain jurisdiction had access to, to health care. So I think that was really key and obviously became a model for, for other um, programs and policies, including the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, and then also thinking about the investments that San Francisco citizens continue to make in, in health care. Um, we have you know, Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital, which was um, a huge investment that, um, that, that the public made in, tr in terms of transforming a public hospital to becoming more modern, more accountable, and more evidence-based. So I think it's really exciting mm -hmm. to be back here and thinking, OK, what are the next steps? What do we need to do? So I think there are multiple um, issues. 
Um, certainly um, continuing Barbara Garcia's leadership in terms of thinking about equity and really involving community in the decision-making progress. Again, I think we see that legacy of, of the HIV world, but Barbara, Director Garcia really brought that forward in ensuring that uh, the, the programs that were put into place were not only evidence-based, but had uh, clear uh, input from community and were co-designed by community to be most effective. Going forward, I think the, the key challenges that we face are obviously at the federal level, there's a lot of instability. So there is a level of, I think, playing defense that we haven't seen before. You Many of you are probably aware of the Title X um, rule changes that are in effect, the conscious clause changes that are going forward. Obviously, there's ongoing disruption with um, what will happen next with, with the Affordable Care Act. And certainly, uh, Larry Levitt's been um, uh, incredibly helpful to local jurisdictions in helping us guide through the, the many um, uh, uh, landmines and potential landmines that are there. But I think trying to be more proactive and perhaps um, inspirational, um, how do we take the, the work that we've done in HIV and um, helping get to zero, and I'll talk to, about that in a little more, more detail, but particularly in behavioral health, I think we're really at a pivot point um, where um, with the opioid epidemic, the, the, uh, meth, the increasing methamphetamine epidemic, um, how do we think about the intersection of mental health and substance use, and how do we actually bring a clear focus on evidence-based interventions? and really figure out as a community and as a system, what are the endpoints that we're aiming for and what does success really look like there? So I think that that's a, a key piece. We have a lot of tool, more tools in our toolkit um, from pharmacologic interventions to uh, more counseling interventions to really apply that evidence, but that's really not been done as effectively as I think it needs to be. Um, our, you know, within behavioral health, there's a lot of focus on Medicaid managed care, and that's a really important piece. But I think from the implementation of that work, it's become much more compliance-driven than client-driven and client-centered and outcome-oriented. So that's a big challenge, because obviously you want to draw down the resources, but you also have to really think about um, how do you actually deliver services to people and really how, you're, how are you really making a difference? So just as we think about the HIV care continuum from the number of people who you know, potentially are living with HIV, being diagnosed with HIV, engaged in care, and then virologically suppressed, we really need to think about a behavioral health continuum. How many people are living with serious and severe mental, and, and mental health and substance use problems? How many people are effectively engaged in care? And then I think the biggest challenge in the field is what is our endpoint, right? Because we don't have a biologic endpoint as convenient as viral load or hemoglobin A1C. So so what does that really look like and what does success look like and what is really a chronic and relapsing condition? So I think we have the tools, we actually have the data, it's really bringing leadership and investment to really um, move that piece forward. And certainly in San Francisco, it's one of Mayor Breed's priorities. She, um, when she announced my appointment, she also announced an appointment of the, the Director of Mental Health Reform, um, who's Dr. Anton Bland, and he's really working with me, he's, he, he's working in the department to figure out how do we get to this next step. In, in uh, in combination with the behavioral health issue, we also obviously have a severe issue around people experiencing homelessness in the city, and of course nationwide it's, it's an issue as well. So I think how do you address the intersection between homelessness and behavioral health in particular, and what does that look like? Well, how do we apply the best models, and how do we make the, the right investments and measure those outcomes going forward so that we know that the taxpayer's dollar is being used most effectively? So that's behavioral health, the, over, the inter, intersection of behavioral health and homelessness. And I would just identify a, a third priority is really around health equity. Um, and even in the city, we just were in the process of our, our budget this year. The health department's budget is $2.4 billion. Um, yeah, the city's budget continues to grow because the tax base is, is very strong, but we still see health inequities and in health outcomes. And particularly around um, with, with black African American communities, that's where the health inequities are the greatest. There are obviously health inequities in other communities as well. But I think we really need to think about leading with race and really have frank conversations about structural racism, including structural racism in all our healthcare system to figure out how to do better um, and, and improve outcomes. We see those disparities in HIV, We'll probably get into that more. We also see them in preterm birth. We see them in hypertension. We see them in diabetes. We see them in behavioral health. We see them in homelessness, right? So there's a common denominator there, which is really around race and racism. So when we're in, in, 
when we're having conversations about our strategic direction going forward in the departments, uh, I really feel very strongly that we need to lead with, with race and racism in our conversations about health and equities. And we've actually recently created a, a department, a, a, a division of, of equity um, in the department. And it's not called health equity because it's equity focused not only on the community equity piece, but internally, how do we provide our services in the most um, culturally um, uh, competent way, in a culturally proficient way, and how are we ensuring that within our own teams and our staff that we are um, looking at looking at delivering our services and interacting in a, in a, through an equity lens. So those are really the, the biggest buckets mm -hmm. um, going forward right now. There'll be others as well, yeah. but those are the main things. That's great. I actually wanted to pick up on something you implied in the beginning, which is, um, and so I saw I'm, in, I'm in DC, so I'm actually, yeah. you know, the instability and the uncertainty is, mm -hmm. is sort of, we're, we're seeing that daily. And San Francisco has always been kind of on the the leading edge mm -hmm. of change and and um, really pushing the limits of what people thought was possible. How how are how is this how are you doing that now? How do you um, be proactive in this environment? What are some of the things that the city and county is is thinking about as there's you know uh, efforts at the federal level to scale back, let's say, on protections for people in healthcare on um, access in, in different yeah. ways, how do, how, yeah, how do you well, do that? I think it's, it's even more important that we go back to our San Francisco values, right? That we've always been cutting edge, we've always pushed the envelope, and we've always looked and served the people who are in most need, regardless of where they come from, who they are, who they love. So I think that we just need to reinforce that and also ensure that we're working um, both from the individual delivery system to the community level to the legal level, right? So how are we ensuring that we're pushing back um, and we're pushing back through evidence. We're not pushing back through belief systems or you know personal you know based on personal relationships or based on tweets. We're we're looking at the science and the data, and really figuring out how do we need to do better. I think an example of where the mayor has really been um, pushing the envelope in this mm -hmm. regard um, is with overdose prevention sites. Right, the mayor's gone on record um, when she talked to me. She was really focused on how do we do this. Now there are lots of complicating issues around that. Um, but I think it's an example of where, particularly through our harm reduction approaches, that we're gonna continue to pursue the evidence and uh, apply where we're able to um, apply programming to, to, to make a difference in people's lives where we, where we need to do better. We know that overdose prevention sites, there's um, rigorous studies from the New England Journal, Lancet, and others that show that um, they save lives um, and that they don't increase uh, use. I think when you look at the vaping data and mm -hmm. the, the vaping legislation that, that we're pushing forward with uh, the Board of Supervisors are voting on it today. Supervisor Walton's been the lead on that with support of the mayor. Uh, Dennis Herrera's been pushing that. Um, how do we make sure that we're not um, uh, creating a whole new generation of of nicotine addicts and uh, eventually, you know, combustion smokers, and the data are there for every, you know, for every one adult who is a is a combustion tobacco smoker who switches to vaping. We're actually the data are showing that 80 young adults become addicted to combustion cigarettes, not just not not just the vaping. So, I think those are some of the cutting edge things that we're continuing to do. So let's go to HIV because that's the um, that's how we got to know each other yeah. through that, and that's your you know original um, focus and passion, and the San Francisco model. So how if you were you know telling that story now, and Merv is here, so he could also probably tell it better than <laughs> any of us. But how did that come about? I mean, what were the elements that really came together to create that from ground zero to getting to zero? Yeah. And, um, what still needs to happen? I mean, San Francisco mm -hmm. is is getting there. It's probably closer than any other jurisdiction yeah. besides maybe New York and in, in, in the U.S. But there's still it's inequities and other things. So, right. you know, what is that story? Well, I think it's really a story of of community and scientists and delivery systems coming together and um, creating a common um, uh, vision and then executing, implementing programs through that vision that aligned with applying the most um, recent science in a way that, that was most effective, right? So, I mean, there are lots of stages in the third year of the epidemic. It certainly didn't happen overnight. But I think it was really being able to take advantage of the great research that was being done, the, the interventions that came forward, um, and applying them quickly on the ground, but also looking at really good data and investments. There's more investment. I mean, I'll just, I'll contrast it to behavioral health right now, right? So, you know, we have very well-developed HIV surveillance systems. Now, 
earlier on, the surveillance systems didn't necessarily link up with the care and treatment systems, right? But, but we had those. There was the Ryan White Care Act and, and that investment in developing models of care that later became evidence of you know, how, you do the, how you do the right thing. Um, having wraparound services, and then I think the prevention side, right? And we moved, we, we graduated from um, sort of the, the, the 1980s, um, early 1990s of, you know, have safer sex to really looking at biologic interventions and testing as, as, as key interventions going forward. So I think it was an iterative process, but it was always going back to the science and having the resources and the commitment. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Paul Volberding, who was key um, from the early days in, 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 in moving, moving this forward. And um, we also have Dr. Hyman Scott, who's actually been very involved in, in the Getting to Zero campaign. And now we've really created as a community um, uh, key pillars that emphasize um, getting tested, right? right? Getting started on treatment. Our treatment number, our, our time to treatment has decreased from um, uh, five months, our, our time to viral load suppression, excuse me, has actually decreased from five months to two months over the last couple of years because we now offer treatment to people as soon as they are diagnosed. And you remember the days where it was like, don't get tested. If you get right. tested, There's don't, so, right? It, so right. we really aggressively um, applied that. Linkaging engagement and care, and then also decreasing stigma and discrimination. HIV diagnosis in the city have gone down um, by 51% between 2012 and 2016. We don't have the new numbers yet this year, but I can tell you they're actually going, well, we do have the right, we do have the numbers. I, I'm not prepared to release them now, but <laughs> they're, going the, they're going in the right direction. So I think that that's really positive. And then we've seen PrEP coverage. Um, and remember, that I think it's also, it's fascinating to be back in the city and have a seven year window of being gone. And I mean, PrEP was very controversial, mm -hmm. right? There was all sorts of questions. And I think you know, some of the things have been borne out. We see syphilis rates increasing dramatically. We have extremely high rates of gonorrhea. But at the same time, our PrEP coverage has dramatically increased We've, uh, by, um, uh, uh, I think, eightfold in the, last, in the last three to four years. So much greater PrEP coverage. But we've also had the inequity issues, right? So when we look at particularly black African-American men and women, the perception of risk is low, the uptake of these new technologies is low, and the engagement in ongoing care is low. So I think the lesson really learned is if you bring community data um, and, and in investment together in such a way that focuses on a, co a collective impact approach so that we have common agreements about what we're headed towards. It's very messy and it takes a while, but having everybody at the table to help drive that is, is really key. The other thing that I think happened was, and again, going back to, the, to behavioral health and sort of how we need to think about changing that, is there was a lot of back and forth between the medical side of HIV and the community side of HIV and the prevention side. And I remember um, when we really pushed for more testing, the test and treat, which mm -hmm. we've never, I mean, I was accused many times of medicalizing HIV, right? And I think it took a while for us to realize it's not an either or, it's not black and white, it's a both and in this situation. So I think that's where we need to go. And I think in behavioral health, you see some of the same um, I don't know if schism is too strong a word, but you do have divisions between people who are really focused on you know, the physician, the psychiatry side, the, the medication um, side, and then you have the community focus on health. And I, see, I think you see some of those tensions as we're thinking about perhaps more aggressive policies in terms of um, providing people with the care and treatment they need who have very serious behavioral health issues. That was a long answer. But, no, that's, uh -huh. I have, I have follow-up questions. Okay, so. all right. Um, so given where, that San Francisco is where it is, and it's also been um, named as one of the communities that's going to be part of this national ending the HIV epidemic initiative, um, what, you know, what, if new resources come, whatever form they're in through that, what would you direct them toward? Yeah, so I think it's really around this, this question of the health equity, health equity. And, and really um, making sure that we are um, focusing on uh, black African-American MSM and women in particular, right? We don't, I mean, one of the key things, of course, in this equity discussion is we're also seeing a lot of displacement in the city, right? So um, we've got to figure, figure that piece out in a broader context. That's part of the health department's role, but not obviously limited to the health department. But we really can drill down very um, granularly to um, individuals and, and ask, you know, why didn't you come in? What was this about? How can we go to you rather than expecting you to come to us? What is it about PrEP that is, um, what's the story on PrEP in, in your community and, and, and why are people 
uh, not, not necessarily taking that. Tell us about how we can serve you better. I think we have to start continue to ask those questions in a very specific way and reach communities that, again, historically have not 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 uh, not come in. So I think that's a key thing. I think it's a challenge um, even with the CDC's initiative because, of course, these these issues and these challenges are not about PRAF, right? They're about a whole history of stigma, discrimination, and racism, right? So I think having to broaden that conversation, and it's not just about the pill, it's not just about the test, it's the whole context in which, in how you're being approached and the, the historical context and how your community was served or most often not served by the larger government structures. And now there's you know, a very well-intentioned clinician or healthcare outreach worker probably very idealistic who's hoping to get you to take a pill. And even that's not verbal, that's not the right approach, right? I'm not gonna try to get you to take a pill. I'm gonna ask you, you know, how you can how how do I work with you to how can I support you in, in, in supporting your own health? So I think changing the narrative and changing the way we approach people. But this is not new either. So I think it's mm -hmm. also important to remember what is new um, is that we have to think about the race, the race and racial piece, and the long history and the context of that while we're interacting with that individual person? It's interesting. I've been asking different people in jurisdictions what they would do if new researches came, and it's, it varies completely, which is, I think, the point, right? It has. Mm -hmm. So in um, D.C., the AIDS director said, "We we have to be able to give treatment on on demand as soon as people are, are diagnosed. We're not doing it." In uh, Mississippi, as might, you might expect, the issue is that we just don't have providers. So mm -hmm. we, you know, so it's just interesting. You're, I think you again are on the leading edge of um, you, you've addressed most of those things, but it's that's not enough. That's um, right. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think it's we're now, and it's also going to as we talk about getting to zero, right? We're we're at the, in the range of 200, maybe just under 200 infections a year now, compared to where we were. You know, a thousand infections um, 10 or 15 years ago, 500 infections. Now we're just at around the 200 mark. Mm -hmm. It's going to get harder to push that number mm -hmm. down, right? Because you're getting into even the more challenging populations. The other piece that I want to emphasize, because it gets so much, the dis the other inequity that's particularly um, uh, uh, a piece which intersects with Black African Americans is homelessness population. So when we actually look at viral load suppression, you, you triggered it in my because we do have a lot of resources compared to other places, yeah. right? And clinical clinical resources. But when you look at the viral load suppression rates, people who are living with HIV who are experiencing homelessness are much more likely to have an elevated viral load. So again, another broader structural issue that's now hitting, you know, at, at, at an endpoint um, that, that's represented as a viral load outcome where it's really how do how we made investments and who have we thought most about in terms of our societal investments from something as as big as housing now reflecting in a viral right. load um, viral load. Right. Yeah. Um, actually, here, a question I'm, I'm curious about because you had, you know, it's not often that somebody goes um, from the sort of local level to the national level and then back. So um, when you first went to the work in the federal government and under a different administration that was probably you know, pursu pursuing a, a, a more <laughs> Put that on the record, expansive yeah. agenda in terms of enhancing access, yeah. um, you know, what were like the, the three things that really surprised you about that? And then coming back here, what new perspective did it, did it give you to come back? Three things. It could be five okay. or it could be two. Uh, well, I think that I, I think the thing that's stood out was that people were really committed to trying to move forward in in addressing the epidemic in the broader context of also implementing the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot of local expertise. So many people at the federal government mm -hmm. stay really at federal, and so many people at the local level stay locally. And I just, I've always had this sort of idea, well, we should have clear pathways where people flip and switch. Because the idea of, oh, here's this great policy, and it could be transformative, and you're talking about billions and billions of dollars, but then when you think about how does this actually apply on the ground, it becomes much more complicated. So I think that that, that was a, a really key piece. And then I also, coming back, I think there's uh, the insularity around the local approach and not really mm -hmm. thinking through it or understanding the, you know, the level of health policy and how those decisions are made, right? So I think that mm -hmm. having trying to figure out how to, how to create better channels that are not necessarily going to be um, oppositional. Because even, even if there's an agreement on you know, the general philosophy of, say, ACA and how that, what that, that that's a good idea, right? And that's a huge health, health equity intervention and the investments are right. 
how that actually gets carried forward from the federal to the state to the local level is very contentious just in terms of you know competing needs and, and competing perspectives but I think if people could spend some time in the respective shoes of the people who are executing it's not like everything will just be solved but I think there'll be a better understanding of why um, people have varying perceptions and, and, and why things may not work at the local level that was thought to work at the federal level and, and vice versa. So that was really quite striking to me actually. So it's been, it's actually been great to go back. There was a little bit of brain shift because, um, you know, just the, the way you think and the way you engage is, is very different at that broad policy level than when you're actually back on the ground executing and implementing. Great. So I have a number of topics that I just wanted to throw out to you and okay. see what, what you Rapid thought fire. about them. Yeah, yeah you know, okay. just a few. But some of, most of what you've brought up, but just to hear a little bit more. You mentioned in the beginning Title X and family mm -hmm. planning, and I'm just curious, uh, you know, just expand on that a little bit more. And with uh, with everything that's happening with women's health access and reproductive health, so what is what are is the city and county doing in terms of Title X or the state, and how is it all playing out? So, just a <laughs> I was few all seconds. Playing out. Well, I think I. I mean, I. I, th I think it's just we're we're balan We're figuring out how to continue to do the right work the um, in the services, and there's also this question of. Um, you know where how are things going to unfold with those 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 new rules um, and yep. what does that mean in terms of resources right um, but we've been really clear that to provide the best care and again how are we going to be able to close the equity gap if you don't um, follow the the data and the, and the science what I get concerned about is obviously if there are punitive approaches being brought forward um, then it becomes a, a question of how do you um, maintain and support resources to continue to deliver services to those communities and it's also I mean, this is again at the granular level where there's you know, how do you make sure that you support staff um, who are doing this work every day in a context of you know what happens tomorrow. I mean, we just saw this. I mean, on Friday when they were they were announcing that there were likely to be ice raids right going forward. There was, I mean, obviously it's devastating and anxiety provoking to community, and we have to both make sure that people understand that we are not ice, but. People don't make a distinction necessarily between, oh, this is a local government worker versus a federal worker, right? And that's sometimes it's hard for us, you know, mm -hmm. to, to always. To, and then I think the other piece is how do we ensure that staff are supported in their work so that they're not constantly um, uh, concerned? You shouldn't, if you're a provider, whether a community provider or a clinician um, in, a, in a DPH clinic, you shouldn't have to be worrying about, you know, what's going to happen from a policing level today that might impact my patients. But I'm really, I'm very concerned that we are at that point in, in many cases now. Yeah, and actually, just another topic you mentioned was the safe injection sites. Mm -hmm. and, and similarly, like, trying to navigate the federal mm -hmm. legal system and, and wanting to move ahead on yeah. that. So overdose yeah. prevention sites. Yep, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm from D.C. And, yeah. we, we have a so I think, I mean, we're, they, they're, we're, we've talked about San Francisco um, Leading and I, you know, it, it, it is a, a mayor's priority, but I also think it's important to acknowledge there are other communities that are looking at this, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Pit, uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, um, uh, New York, um, others are, are looking at Seattle, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, I think one of the questions is how do we share our knowledge and our, our work and then also have strength through numbers in terms of thinking about potentially. Um, uh, viable solutions that, right. that could actually deliver services to people that would also um, not necessarily um, intersect with some of the law enforcement that has been um, uh, uh, potentially, that could potentially be brought forward. I was just up in Vancouver um, two weeks ago visiting their their projects. And what was, again, it's like, oh, it's, you, you know, Vancouver's doing it and it's it's all, well and good. They had years of struggle. They had different governments come in. They had different court rulings. So, you know, hindsight, it, it, it looks all like it's it's a fully ramped up and supported system, but they were through many iterations and now they have a robust and very impressive system that's truly harm reduction approach that's saving lives every day. So I don't know how long it will take for us to get there. The state bill has actually been delayed um, uh, again, so I think we have to see what happens over the next mm -hmm. um, few months to, to figure out potential next steps. So staying in that topic, mm -hmm. I read that fentanyl overdoses are becoming more of an issue. It mm -hmm. hasn't been a, historically a big issue here as much. 
That's right. And now it's it's yeah. So fentanyl. So our overdose deaths cross fent fentanyl cross, which we knew was going to happen, right? right? Unfortunately, it was inevitable. We were watching curves in other communities and seeing that yep. this was this was going to happen. Um, and it it's also walking the streets and and talking to people and watching people use what stood out. And I think I asked Rachel, who's, who's our communication director, I noticed there's a lot of foil out again. And I thought, well, foil, I haven't seen foil since like the late 80s, early 90s. Why is there a foil back? And I probably most of you know, but it was it's because people are smoking fentanyl now as a harm reduction approach because there's there's less um, there's less it, it, it's it's a harm reduction approach. There's right. less chance that they will overdose and die as a result of it. So that was a right. striking barometer on the street before we even got our data that okay, it's really here mm -hmm. and it's back and it's going to inevitably cross. Uh, but I think thinking I mean we've had very um, very high naloxone coverage, right? So mm -hmm. we've we've broadened that. We continue to do that. We have naloxone everywhere. Um, it's it's in law enforcement. It's with care providers, and most importantly, it's with users, right? So users are are, are the ones who are trying to get it in their hands, and we have very robust systems in that. And then obviously, we continue to take the the harm reduction mm -hmm. approach. But I think that some of the other interventions around substance use treatment and making sure that people have access to buprenorphine is really key. We have a street medicine team that's starting buprenorphine on the streets. Um, I just was looking at the data. We've, it's, so if you talk about treatment on demand, um, we actually have people out there starting people on the street. We've had about 500 starts um, um, where people are, are, are out there doing that. So I think those are the sorts of models that we need to take to the next level. And the thing that, it, that goes back to the HIV side mm -hmm. is, right, we're starting people on treatment as soon as they test positive. Now we're actually starting people on buprenorphine where they are right on the street and maybe, you know, right after they overdose or if, you know. Yeah. And, and so there's, I think there's a lot of innovation going on at that person-to-person that -person level. So it definitely seems like a model. It's not happening in DC nearly at that level. Is that right? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Yeah. And also, we continue yeah. a robust needle exchange. Right. Syringe access. Sorry. Syringe access. <laughs> um, well, I think it, I say that because there are a lot of needles on there. There's a perception. Right that there are lots of needles on the street. We actually collect millions of needles back. Um, and we know from the science that a one-to-one -one exchange actually increases HIV and hepatitis infection rates. So we're continuing to move that forward. But we also, and I think it's really important to acknowledge the other part of harm reduction is that as a community, people shouldn't have to see needles on their streets and be worried about being stuck or just, you know, so I think we need to have that robust uh, uh, approach to making sure that clean and safe environments are for all communities and that while we're providing the people who use drugs the safest alternatives uh, or the safer safer alternatives excuse me safer alternatives that that we're also uh, making sure that communities as a whole remain healthy and safe and that's certainly a priority that that I bring and I know it's one of the mayor's um, priorities as well. Great. So I have one more quick question and then we'll go to your questions. So start thinking about those. Um, there's a number of people I see here who are involved in AIDS 2020, which is mm. the uh, International AIDS Conference coming back in a year from now. Um, if we all can get get there, um, what are your thoughts about that? I just probably you're you're focused right now. I know on all these challenges right before you. Yeah. Uh, you know, having been involved in <laughs> bringing the conference back to the U.S. many years, you know, in 2012 and your long history here. What what are you? What's the city thinking about? Uh, this or are you at this point? <laughs> when will you? Well, I think so. I am thinking about it. I think it's really exciting that we're we're uh, co-hosting with Oakland, yep. right? So I think that that's a really key piece in having uh, Oakland as 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 our as as we're partners with Oakland in, in this work. And I think again, it's an opportunity to highlight the Bay Area as doing the groundwork breaking work that that we that many people in this room have done and continue to do. Um, highlighting the getting to zero and highlighting the, the, the inequities that I already talked about. Um, and it's an exciting way for us to learn from other people who are coming here uh, to the conference. But I think it, it really is um, an opportunity for us to think about what the next steps are as a community with, with HIV in general. And you know, I think one of the things that comes up in these international conferences is a lot is, and you, you alluded to it about, you were polite about it, but you know, San Francisco has so many resources. Mm -hmm. How can you know? How does this apply to in, you know other cities in California, or you know, how does this apply? But I actually think if you look at how things have moved forward, um, yes, we do have resources that other communities probably need and, and, and should have as well. But things that start in San Francisco um, don't stay in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I also think we also we we need to be humble and think about things that we can bring forward from other 
communities and, and countries and how do we apply them here. So I'm going to be looking for those sorts of ideas at the AIDS 2020 conference as Great. well. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, it's your turn. So uh, raise your hand if you, when you have a question. We have mics. And then I'll just ask that you stand up and just say who you are. Um, and we'll take your question. We'll do one at a time. Anybody? I know somebody. Else. Okay, great. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Andrew Kelly um, from Cal State East Bay. Um, so you had mentioned mental health and substance abuse as main priorities. Um, and we've seen how important Medicaid and Medicaid expansion has been in combating those problems. But you also mentioned ICE and fear in the immigrant community. So I'm wondering, as the governor and the legislature push to expand Medicaid to undocumented populations in California, what's your does your department play a role in kind of reaching out and helping to enroll this population and reducing some of that fear that might be a barrier to accessing yeah. that care? Yeah. So obviously, I think it's, thank you for bringing that. It's very exciting. It's very important, um, and it's a key investment that the that, that Governor Newsom and, and the legislature are supporting. Um, we do play an important role. It, it's, this is a little sort of inside city baseball, but basically social services, which is a separate department, does the enrollment piece, and we do the care piece. I think it's also important to emphasize that we take care of people regardless of if they're undocumented. People get substance use and mental health care right now. Um, so I, 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 it's really important to emphasize that, but I think also just making sure that people sign up and are in, engaged in that program so that if somebody's eligible, we can certainly ensure that they, they get signed up um, going forward to, to the program. And it certainly helps bring more resources in the system and allows them to have uh, uh, greater access to, to services over the long term. So I think it's huge. And there is this very real, real federal um, part of the, of the question that you had that, you know, we need to make sure that people understand that we are open, open for business and that we will do everything we can to protect communities and their health because we're the health department. That's what we do. That's great. Certainly in research that my colleagues have done, we've documented, they've documented that um, people are not coming forward for health care that they are eligible for and entitled to because they're fear. So it's, it's serious. Other questions? Great. Hi, I'm Claire Brindis at UC San Francisco, and first, congratulations. We're thrilled that you're back home. You. Um, secondly, I'm thrilled that you're talking about evidence. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit more about how you're looking at the issue of homelessness, because especially around data collection and the interoperability between various systems and our efforts in the past, mm -hmm. And data drives decision making, mm -hmm. and vice versa. So, could you give in us a little <laughs> in, in the in the real world, um, real world evidence? Yeah. Um, so, maybe you could share a little bit about where what you know what's coming up. If you're the surfer on the on the calm oceans, mm -hmm. but you know that a wave is coming, yeah. could you share a little bit about where we're heading? Yeah. So, I, I thank you for the question, and I do believe in, in the department is already very data driven in, in many places, but not everywhere. So I really want to focus on that because I do think that we get things, we do better when we're data driven and we know how we're doing when we're data driven. We know where the investments need to be made when we're data driven. So that's key. One of the key things that is happening, um, which is uh, a big deal, is we're actually switching all of, we've, we had at some point 59, what I, uh, often called siloed data systems within the, in the, in the department. I call them artisanal systems because basically it's somebody who got a grant right from CDC, Kath probably you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, build out a system to be able to monitor this X disease in this population and it was, you know, it cost $50,000 a year to continue that. We have 58 or 59 of these artisanal systems throughout the system. We're actually making a huge transformation. The first phase is August um, 3rd, where we transform our healthcare system to one um, medical record, EPIC, um, and it's, it's huge. We've trained 9,000 people at this point. And so at, at the end of the day, we will be able to have a unified um, system of, of monitoring data. And as a provider, I worked at the UCSF AIDS clinic for many years. I still remember having a woman come in looking up her HIV and viral load result. She told me she went to the city clinic, which is our STD clinic. That didn't show up on the record. I actually had to have city clinic fax me. This was not that long ago. Fax me, I had to fax them back a release form. I, I mean, so this whole care coordination piece is huge. We also, I think, need to do better, um, and I'm looking at this, how do we share data across departments 
in a way that helps people and also protects information. There's a separate Department of, of Homelessness and Supportive Housing now, so it's really key as we support the behavioral health and the physical health of people who are um, experiencing homelessness or who are in permanent supportive housing, how do we coordinate our data with them and others including social services and, 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 and so forth. So I think we really need to look at that. We're also looking in our criminal justice system, particularly around the intersection of behavioral health and criminal justice. Our health commission, which is the, which are my bosses, you know, they're really focused on how do we do better data around that. So I think the first big step is internally, right? We have to be honest about our own capabilities and, and competencies. I will just say that also at the federal level, one thing that I think is really holding this back, which is reminiscent of when HIV, you know, the, the HIV reporting was so controversial, is around substance use treatment care and data and how that's separated from mental health care and data. And yet all we talk about is co-occurring conditions, co-occurring conditions. Oh, but you can't share the data about this co-occurring addition. And then that lack of ability to be transparent, share the data with providers who provide the physical health or the social services. And I really think that's key to transforming the system of, of behavioral care for outcomes. I actually think healthcare is probably the last industry that still uses fax machines. Yeah, I don't know. There is one in my office. I was like, what's that? I mean, uh, there's, you still have to fax certain things. Yeah, exactly. Like, how is that happening? Even in San Francisco. We still have pagers. Yeah. OK, well, there's, there's technology needs to do something about that. Um, exactly. Other questions? Yeah. Back here and then up here. How do you see your role in the environmental? Oh, Kelly Walsh. Um, how do you see your role in the environmental justice issues? And I think of Hunter's Point in particular as a, a big issue, but there are others around the city. Yeah. So I think it goes back to the the, inequ the question of inequity, right? And well, I actually think it's it's a combination of the environment bringing that environmental health to the conversation in public health. And again, it's interesting to me that the environmental justice movement, while obviously has done incredible work and was really um, uh, very, has shown very strong leadership in putting the issue on the table in, in policy ways, it's sort of a, oh yeah, in public health, from public health, it's not it, it, it's it's evolved. It's had to it's had to con make that connection. It's not it's not the systems were not naturally aligned. So I think making sure that we bring that environmental health perspective when we talk about health inequities, particularly the environmental the environmental justice side. So I think I think that that's really key. I also think from an environmental justice piece, we just had uh, three days last week of 90 plus degree weather in San Francisco. Right, so when you think about the five or 10 year um, uh, uh, timeline around temperatures, we think about our aging population, we think about people on the streets the most vulnerable. How do we think about being prepared and responsive to climate change? It is the biggest health issue of our time. It will be bigger and it will at risk um, creating even more inequities in the communities who, who need us. So just looking at things as granulars, where are cooling centers in the city? Do people who are from communities that don't often have access to information know how to stay cool? How do we ensure that our hospitals, especially for elderly patients, for instance, in Laguna Honda Hospital, how do we make sure while they're designed to be environmentally um, uh, sound, how do we make sure that we're able to cool so we don't have um, offices um, getting to 95 degrees? I had we had clinics in our system a couple of weeks ago that were hitting the 90, 95 degree mark. And so how do you think about providing uh, support for people in, in those systems. It's a, it's a huge issue going forward. So I really appreciate your work, your bringing it up. We have a very active environmental um, health team that's looking at all, all these pieces going forward. But it is a, is a key concern of mine and a priority is also the infrastructure piece, right? How do we invest in the infrastructure so that our buildings are sound, so that we're able to, re to be adaptive to what I think is, an, not what I think, which, what is an inevitable warming trend in our, in our community. Okay, thanks. Up here. Let's use the mic just because there are some people watching. I brought up the homeless, and I'm really thrilled to see that there's a real uh, interaction with the various homeless agencies. But the thing that has always disappointed me, and I think Gavin Newsom may be doing something about this, is what kind of coordination are we doing regionally? Mm -hmm. It seems to me if you do something in San Francisco or don't, or you do it in Oakland. Or that has impact, and nobody seemed in the past to really be looking beyond the borders. Mm -hmm. 
So great question, and that's something that Mayor Breed also is, has brought forward in, in terms of making a more regional response to the issue. And what I would recommend is Jeff Kaczynski, who's the director of the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, who's really uh, looking at how to tie these various pieces together, that he would be the best person to address this. But I, the last I look, Governor Newsom is looking at investing in resources to allow that regional approach, because having been in two different local jurisdictions, the irony is, is that the, 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 the funds don't allow for that na natural um, uh, communication. So even though Marin is across the Golden Gate Bridge, all data and communication, not all, all communication stopped, but it, it, it did it, it, there was not a smooth um, uh, collaboration or sharing of information or helping clients sort of figure out, given where they are, where they were going, how do we best serve them as a, as a, as, as, as jurisdiction. So I'm really excited about what Governor Newsom is proposing, and Jeff Kaczynski would be able to give you more um, details on that. Okay. Yeah. It's a quiet crowd. I'm Charlotte Dixon, I'm with Village Movement California, and I wanted to just ask you about your thoughts about the older adult population in San Francisco. Speaking of Gavin Newsom, he's called for the master plan for aging, and um, just wanted to hear your thoughts yeah. about serving that population. Yeah. So thank you for the question. Um, in some ways, I think when you talk about the population experiencing homelessness, you are talking about aging because work by Margot Cushell at UCSF and others show that people living on the street age um, decades, um, their, their biologic age is several decades higher than their chronologic age. So I think it's really important that when we're talking about the aging population that that group be thought of because a, a 50 year old on the street is basically a, a, a house 70 year old, right? Um, so I think it's really um, key. I also think one of the key pieces is thinking about our, the intersection of behavioral health with dementia and what does that look like. And I do think it's a huge challenge for us going forward in terms of cognitive ability, memory care, um, dementia care models, and how those do or do not intersect with, be, with behavioral health. I will be quite frank. I mean, one of the key things there is that there's no um, focused funding stream around that, right? There's not adequate support for that. So if you have someone who comes through a behavioral health door and has a cognitive disability, we will of course take care of them, but they are often um, put into different um, uh, uh, different routes and different different places to go. And there's just not the, the robust support that it's needed for that. So I think at both the local, state, and federal level, we really need to figure that out, right? Because we also know these are co-occurring conditions. So I think that, um, and then of course with climate change, we need to think about how do we provide um, uh, elderly adults ways to cope with, with heat, because we know that they're that they are among the most vulnerable uh, along with, with very young children. Um, and then we're working with the Department of Aging in the city to make sure that our delivery system and our public health system is aligned with their aging action plan and uh, looking at how to particularly um, I'd better address the issue of, of cognitive disability, dementia, and, and behavioral health. That's a real focus of ours going forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In the back, Judy, and then we'll Hi, Judy just take Hi. a, yeah. Thanks, Jen and Grant. This has been fantastic. So I'm going to switch to ask a different kind of question, which I hope you don't mind, Grant. There are a number of people in the audience who are young and probably early to mid-career. You've had a really interesting career trajectory from medicine to research, to public health, national, local. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of insights and advice you might give to earlier career folks or mid-career people who might be thinking about changing their direction or don't know how you learn about the particular kind of trajectory that you've had. So sort of how did it happen, if you don't mind talking about it? How do you balance your kind of personal family life, sorry, Rod, uh, and your work life? Um, and how do you kind of move on a trajectory like that? How do people find out about it? What have you learned from that? What are your take homes? I appreciate the question. Um, uh, I thought the other ones were hard. But, um, <laughs> so um, I think, well, since Judy, you asked the question, I think one of the key things is making sure that you great you you um, have great mentors um, from early on, and 
Judy and others have, have been part of that. So I think it's really important to make sure that um, as you think about what you may want to do to get mentors and get mentors who are not necessarily um, you know, so aligned with what you're doing at the moment that you don't have an opportunity to, to expand your horizons, right? So, you know, if you're in medicine, you might want to get a mentor who's focused on policy if you think at some point you might want to do policy or social sciences because maybe social sciences will help you even if you decide to stay in clinical medicine be a better better care provider um, also making sure that you get you know the people who support you are oftentimes you know your your superiors or your bosses but also that you have mentees who are not that because it's often very hard for um, for a boss because that's a different role than a mentee because they're, they're they're competing issues sometimes with regard to that so I think that that's really key and then um, I probably should start off by saying this, but get a great partner um, and a great, a great family, um, and, and you know, think about uh, ensure that there there is that support and that you support um, them in, in what they're doing. And then I have to say, um, and this is something that was a little bit hard for me, but but try new things. I mean, it's some, it's it's scary. It's you get to. I mean, I got to certain points where it was clear, like I could do this, be here for a really long time, um, and you know, I think you have to stay. I, I like to stay somewhat uncomfortable in my work because if I'm uncomfortable, that means I'm being challenged. I don't mean like physically uncomfortable, but, <laughs> but I mean just you know. So I think so. You have to figure out that for yourself. That's a very personal decision. But um, going to different things and embracing uh, change, if that's what you want to do. Some of us are really happy doing the you know staying in the position that that we've been in, becoming very focused on a very specific piece of research, applying for our NIH grants for years that are you know, very granular. And I think that's fantastic. And that's the information we use. And then you know, others want to change it up every so often. Um, so I think it's, it's really trying to figure out how do you get most exposure to, the most diff to the, as many ideas and career tra trajectories as possible, get that mentoring, and make sure that um, you have that, that personal balance as well. And that's a vague answer, but it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a long answer, a longer answer otherwise. Yeah, we had one back of uh, three, it looks like. One, two, three. Yeah. And then we, we have time for three, definitely. Maybe if there's one more, we'll probably take it. Hi, my name's Topher Reynoso. I'm from Gusto. Uh, we're a tech company here in San Francisco, and we serve thousands of small businesses for HR benefits. Um, and I'd love to hear any thoughts on how the small business, how small employers can impact some of the topics that you're talking about today. If you could request them to contribute in some meaningful way in, in one or two points, love to hear about it to take it back to them. And then also, is there any meaningful data you could derive from small employers that would be meaningful to contribute towards health in the community? Yeah. Great question. Thank you. And I, I think it depends on, so first of all, I think that just having the small employers and the business community being civic minded and thinking about how do they, you know, how do they help um, support the communities in which they're they're working and 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 what does that look like and I think doing some of that work through a social justice lens would be really important and key I think that they're very um, uh, there's some some key things that could be as specific as you know providing opportunities for people with behavioral health diagnoses to do an internship to see you know how can they how does it expose them to new w ways and new career trajectories um, working with um, with schools and, 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 and figuring out internship possibilities and potential, particularly in schools that serve communities of color, where you know having that experience in early on can really be, be very meaningful. Providing scholarships, having um, internships with government agencies. So you know, I talked about the lack of, of going between federal and, and local government. There's also very little um, back and forth between local government and industry. Although a lot, of, some people go from government to industry, but there's a lack of going the other way a lot. So I think about I think about those pieces, and then there's sort of the the more obvious answer about making substantial investments um, in things like addressing homelessness um, and, and and so forth. Um, I also think looking at where investments can be made where government generally can't make those investments or doesn't make those investments, what, what, what one-time funding mechanisms are meaningful and sustained. I think one of the challenges in private investment in government systems is it's often one time and that can create a shiny program and then two or three years later that shiny program is, is gone and not by intent, intent doesn't really matter here, it's consequences, sometimes that can do more harm in communities that were trying to be reached than, than good. So lots of opportunity. I'd love to talk to you about more. And thank you for the question. 
Yes. Hi, uh, Deb Lowry from uh, Zolo Healthcare. I'm a consultant. Um, the question is, do you have, uh, can you talk about populations or communities in the city where you don't have adequate um, provider resources available to meet the need? Well, I think it, I would talk about resources in general and include the provider resource. And I think our focus again is on, on that intersection between people experiencing homelessness and, and behavioral health and physical health. And I think that's why, you know, this year in the mayor's budget, the, the mayor's invested um, a, a, a transformative investment in terms of expanding our behavioral health beds so that we actually have more services available for people who need them. Also low, um, low barrier beds for people who suffer from behavioral health issues but are not able to get through a very stringent screening criteria. So we have something called Hummingbird Place, which is low barrier, open to, to everybody, and come and go as, as needed. And then expanding our street medicine team, it's that in shelter medicine work. So starting those buprenorphine treatments on, on the spot with people. So I think that's really where our focus is because we recognize that it's very important to not only help that individual and that individual's um, family, but also um, for, for the community overall. So that's, that's where you see the, the investments uh, now. And I think that's where they will also be focused on going forward in a, in a data-driven way. Because we have lots of tools in our toolbox and we just have to figure out how to apply them better and then how to measure those outcomes in a way that's that's showing that we're making a difference. All right, so I think we have time for one more question. Quick question. Uh, hi, Grant. Thank you. Uh, my name is TJ Lee. I'm just curious, what could you do to help with the Office of AIDS and the self-report six months for ADAP? Uh, so many of my clients, I fill the paperwork out, I put a return address on it, send it off, and then they go to the pharmacist on six months and one day, and they don't. They say they don't have ADAP anymore. And then I've had clients leave, and then they don't see me for another three weeks, so then they're not on their meds. And I'll just give you a quick example. My husband and I, I fill out my paperwork for the last five years every year at our self-reports in the mid-year. We lose our ADAP and mm -hmm. we have to go back through. And I know how to advocate for myself, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. I'm sorry that you go through that. Um, and just as I was saying, HIV is so client-centered, you bring this up, so there's still more work <laughs> to do there. Um, I can certainly take that back to our HIV health services team and see where it seems, I mean, again, it's bureaucracy, but hopefully it can be something that could be fixed. So I'll certainly uh, share that with the team and see if there's, there's some ability to do that. So I'm gonna, we're going to end this because I saw a couple of people leave. It's, it's uh, 1 o'clock. We have lunch for you back there. But before you get up and get lunch, we really hope you, you can. Um, and maybe Grant can stay for a few minutes. Please um, join me in thanking him for being here. Thank you. And I just want to thank Kaiser because it's still the place. I mean, it's the place where we go for objective, cutting edge, helpful information so really thank you for thank your you. work thank you larry for your for your work and um we'll move onward together yeah. so thank All you all right thanks please stay have some lunch thanks